Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 56, Labor, Football, and the 15th Amendment. Scientism is the idea that science and the scientific method are the best or only way to generate facts about the world. Some intellectuals have also adopted it as a derogatory term with the meaning of an inflated trust in the effectiveness of natural science spread to all areas of study as philosophy and the social sciences. Social scientists such as Friedrich Hayek have often used the term scientism to define, for example, the dogmatic acceptance of scientific methods and the reduction of all understanding to only that which is gauged or affirmative. In other words, the truth is found only in actual figures and those do not align within the purview are eliminated. Academia can be a cult. It follows a particular dogma that removes anecdotes and outliers as heretics and excommunicates them from the congregation. History is a science. It is not excluded from this type of inquisition. And this is for good reason. A consensus is needed so that society can have a launching point to move forward. But if we have seen anything these past few years and during the COVID pandemic, not all dissenting opinions hold the same merit. But everyone is so often a heretic is burned at the stake and comes a martyr in the world of historical thought. Howard Zinn was an American historian that I often cite in my classes. As a good friend of Wikipedia regales us, Zinn wrote over 20 books, including his best-selling and influential A People's History of the United States in 1980. We do not see eye to eye on every aspect of American history. But should that be a sin? Our society seems hell-bent on having the same ideologies screenshot and superimposed within our collective brains. There is much to learn from his approach to history. Zinn described himself as an anarchist and a socialist. He wrote extensively about the civil rights anti-war movement and the labor history of the United States. These are topics that would garner a few political enemies. Numerous pundits and fellow historians have denounced the people's history of the United States. Analysts claim egregious omissions of critical historical events, uncritical dependency on subjective sources, and neglect to analyze different arguments. In July 2013, whistleblowers revealed that Mitch Daniels, the then sitting Republican governor of Indiana, asked for assurance from his education advisors that instructors did not teach Zinn's work in K-12 public schools in the state. Daniels also wanted a cleanup of K-12 professional development courses to eliminate propaganda, as he called it. But that hasn't stopped Zinn's message. While almost sacrificed on the altar of public opinion, he has risen as a saint of healthy distrust. His dissent from the established opened up much dialogue and has helped steal away history from the gatekeepers. Keep that healthy skepticism. It's your gift as a red-blooded American. And as Zinn says... You can't be neutral on a moving train. The National Woman Suffrage Association The National Woman Suffrage Association was formed on May 15, 1869, to work for women's suffrage in the United States. Its prominent leaders were Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It was created after the women's rights movement split over the proposed 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which would, in effect, extend voting rights to black men. One wing of the campaign supported the amendment. In contrast, the other, the wing that formed the NWSA, opposed it, insisting that voting rights be extended to all women and all African Americans simultaneously. The NWSA worked primarily at the federal level in its campaign for women's right to vote. In the early 1870s, it encouraged women to attempt to vote and to file lawsuits if prevented, arguing that the Constitution implicitly enfranchised women through its guarantees of equal protection for all citizens. Many women tried to vote, notably Susan B. Anthony, who was arrested and found guilty in a widely publicized trial. After the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution did not implicitly enfranchise women, 
the NWSA worked for an amendment that would do so explicitly. Women's suffrage in the U.S. emerged as a significant issue in the mid-1800s. A key event was the first women's rights convention, the Seneca Falls Convention, in 1848, which Elizabeth Cady Stanton initiated. Women's right to vote was endorsed at the convention only after a vigorous debate about a controversial idea, even within the women's movement. Soon after the convention, however, it became a central tenant of the campaign. In 1866, Antony and Stanton organized the 11th National Women's Rights Convention, the first since the Civil War began. Its members consisted mainly of activists in the women's rights and abolitionist movements, and its leadership included such prominent activists as Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, and Frederick Douglass. The convention voted to transform itself into the American Equal Rights Association, whose purpose was to campaign for the equal rights of all citizens, especially the right to suffrage. Over time, the American Equal Rights Association members, whose primary interest was women's suffrage, began to divide into two wings. One wing, whose leading figure was Lucy Stone, was willing for black men to achieve suffrage first, as the abolitionist movement insisted, and wanted to maintain close ties with the Republican Party. The other, whose leading figures were Stanton and Anthony, wanted women and black men to be enfranchised at the same time and work toward a politically independent women's movement that would no longer be dependent on abolitionists for financial and other resources. In 1868, Anthony and Stanton began publishing The Revolution, a weekly women's rights newspaper in New York City that became essential for supporting their wing of the movement. The dispute became increasingly bitter after the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was introduced prohibiting the denial of suffrage because of race. Stanton and Anthony opposed the amendment, which would enfranchise black men, insisting that they should simultaneously enfranchise all women and all African Americans. Stanton argued in the pages of the revolution, sometimes using racially condescending language, that by enfranchising almost all men while excluding all women, the amendment would give constitutional authority to the idea that men were superior to women, creating an aristocracy of sex. Lucy Stone supported the amendment while arguing that suffrage for women would be more beneficial to the country than suffrage for black men. The American Equal Rights Association essentially collapsed after an acrimonious convention in 1869, and it created two rival women's suffrage organizations in its wake. The National Woman Suffrage Association was formed on May 15, 1869, two days after what turned out to be the American Equal Rights Association's last convention, with Anthony and Stanton as its primary leaders. The American Woman Suffrage Association was formed in November 1869, with Lucy Stone as its primary leader. The American Woman Suffrage Association was initially larger and better funded. Still, Stanton and Anthony were more widely known as leaders of the women's suffrage movement and were more influential in setting its direction. Many suffragists were appalled by the split and insisted on reunification. Theodore Tilton, a newspaper editor and women's rights advocate initiated a petition drive calling for an end to the division. In April 1870, he convened a meeting of members of both organizations to merge the two groups. Anthony opposed the merger, as did her rival Lucy Stone. The National Woman Suffrage Association sent three official representatives to the meeting who reported that their organization would agree to a merger only if the new organization agreed to work toward a 16th Amendment to enfranchise women. Lucy Stone and two other American Woman Suffrage Association members who were present as unofficial representatives of their organization left the meeting at that point. Those remaining, including some non-affiliated activists, formed a new organization the Union Woman Suffrage Association, with Tilton as president and a 16th Amendment as its central goal. Soon afterward, the executive committee of the moribund American Equal Rights Association met and voted, over Stone's objection, to merge into the Union Woman Suffrage Association. The following month, the National Woman Suffrage Association integrated into the Union Woman Suffrage Association, essentially becoming the National Woman Suffrage Association under a new name. In May 1870, Anthony was forced to sell the revolution because of mounting debts, thereby losing the National Woman Suffrage Association's primary media voice. 
the National Woman Suffrage Association afterward depended on smaller periodicals, such as the National Citizen and Ballot Box. The National Woman Suffrage Association benefited from the extensive lecture tours that Stanton and Anthony undertook, which brought recruits into the organization and strengthened it at the local, state, and national levels. From 1869 to 1879, Stanton traveled on the lecture circuit for eight months, usually delivering one lecture per day and two on Sundays. Their journeys during that period covered a distance unmatched by any other reformer or politician. Anthony traveled 13,000 miles in one year alone and gave at least 170 lectures. The National Woman Suffrage Association did not have a national office, its mailing address being simply that of one of the officers. Anthony and Stanton did not receive a salary from the organization, supporting themselves with the money they earned by lecturing. In Anthony's case, the money flowed the other way, with her lecture fees helping to fund the organization after she had paid the revolution's debts. The fact that Anthony was unmarried gave her a legal advantage in building the organization. A married woman at that time had the legal status of femme covered, which, among other things, excluded her from signing contracts. As Anthony had no husband, she had the legal status of a femme soul, enabling her to sign contracts for convention halls and printed materials. Black Friday Ulysses S. Grant's popularity slipped as his presidency progressed, and scandals damaged his reputation. None struck closer to home than Black Friday, the collapse of the U.S. gold market on September 24, 1869. Two well-known scoundrels at the root of the scandal were Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. The two financiers had worked together in 1868, when they used stock fraud and bribery to keep Cornelius Vanderbilt from taking control of their own dairy railroad. Now, they tried their hands at cheating Wall Street investors. When Ulysses S. Grant took office, he seemed ready to continue Andrew Johnson's monetary policy. Like Johnson, Grant tried to improve the economy by reducing the supply of greenbacks or paper dollars. He did so by using gold to buy dollars from citizens at a discount and replacing them with currency backed by gold. If carried out, this policy would spoil Gould and Fisk's plans. They hoped that the government would hold on to its gold. Meanwhile, they would buy as much gold as possible and watch the value rise. When the price of gold got high enough to gain them a considerable profit, they would sell. But if Grant decided to put more gold on the market by trading it for greenbacks, the price would stay too low. To convince Grant not to sell gold, the two schemers recruited Abel Rathbone Corbin. Corbin, also a financier, had married Grant's sister Virginia. Gould and Fisk used Corbin to get close to Grant. Again and again, the men arranged to meet Grant at social gatherings involving the Corbins. Gould and Fisk used these occasions to talk about government monetary policy. Corbyn backed them in these discussions, in which the financiers argued against the government's sale of gold. Grant's response to their ideas was ambivalent, but the men were encouraged by his hospitality and willingness to engage them in conversation. They worked hard to minimize their risk. Corbyn convinced Grant to name General Daniel Butterfield as Assistant Treasurer of the United States. Butterfield's job was to handle government gold sales on Wall Street. In return for a piece of the action, Butterfield agreed to tip the schemers off when the government was ready to sell gold. The plan seemed like an easy way to get rich, until it fell through. Grant became suspicious of Corbyn's sudden interest in the gold market. And when he discovered a letter from his sister to his wife discussing the matter, he knew he was being conned. Grant was furious. He sent word that Corbyn should stop his plan immediately. Soon after, Grant ordered the sale of $4 million in government gold. Starting on September 20th, Gould and Fisk bought as much gold as possible. Just as they had planned, the price went higher. At its highest point on September 24th, the cost of an ounce of gold reached more than $30 above what it was when Grant took office. But when the government gold hit the market, so did panic. Within minutes, 
The price of gold plummeted, and investors scrambled to sell their holdings. Many investors had obtained loans to buy their gold. With no money to repay the loans, they were ruined. Among those who lost big on Black Friday was Abel Corbin. The wily Gould escaped disaster by selling his gold before the market began to fall. In the congressional investigation that followed, General Daniel Butterfield was removed from his post. But loyal Republicans refused to allow the testimony of Virginia Corbin and First Lady Julia Grant. Black Friday scarcely put a dent in Jay Gould's financial career. Within five years, he controlled the Union Pacific Railroad. Gould managed several other interests, including the Western Union Telegraph Company and the Manhattan Elevated Railroad. Fisk's luck, and Fisk himself, proved shorter lived. In 1872, after arguments over money and a Broadway showgirl named Josie Mansfield, a fellow financier named Edward Stokes, shot Fisk dead. The Knights of Labor The Knights of Labor was founded as a clandestine society of tailors in Philadelphia in 1869. It grew and had prestige in the early days of the American labor movement from the mid to late 1800s. Uriah S. Stevens, a descendant of early Quaker settlers in New Jersey, founded the Knights of Labor on Thanksgiving Day 1869 in Philadelphia. When Stevens' family lost everything during the economic panic and depression of the late 1830s, he became an indentured worker, bound to work without pay in exchange for training as an apprentice mechanic. Stevens' work experiences led him to believe that tremendous societal changes were crucial. It wasn't just enough for a group of workers at one company to strike for higher wages, he thought. Instead, all wage earners had to be brought together into a single organization, which could then fight for their interests. Stevens saw his chance when the local garment cutters union disbanded after failing to get better wages from local clothing companies. He called a meeting at his home, and six garment cutters showed up. Stevens presented his concept for an organization, the noble and holy order of the Knights of Labor, whose members would be pledged to secrecy and follow rituals like masonry. Over the decade following, the Knights expanded nationwide, attracting a range of workers in different industries, from blacksmiths and boilermakers to bricklayers and carpet weavers. The only occupations they banned were bankers, lawyers, gamblers, and saloon keepers. In 1879, Stevens stepped down, and Terence versus Powderly, a machinist of Irish Catholic ancestry from Carbondale, Pennsylvania, was elected to take his place. Under Powderly's oversight, in 1881, the Knights asserted that women would be accepted as members and have equal rights in the organization as men did. At the time, it was seen as a revolutionary stance. At the height of the Knights' clout in the mid-1880s, the organization claimed a membership of 700,000. At the apex of their power, the Knights achieved some significant successes. In 1884, when the Union Pacific Railroad cut workers' wages by 10%, the Knights quickly organized a strike. Led by organizer Joseph Buchanan, the Knights shut down every railroad shop from Omaha, Nebraska, to Ogden, Utah, and all the branch lines. It only took four days for the railroad bosses to retract the pay reduction. When the railroad tried the same move three months later, the Knights launched another strike, forcing the company to admit defeat in five days and restore workers' pay. Shortly afterward, the Knights waged even more significant successful strikes in 1884-85 against the Wabash Railroad and Southwest Railroad system controlled by financier Jay Gould, but it wasn't just better wages that the Knights campaigned for. The organization supported broad-ranging social and economic reform, including an eight-hour workday, health and safety laws to protect workers, and a system that would provide for them if they were injured on the job, an early version of workers' compensation insurance. The Knights also backed an end to child and convict labor, equal pay for women, and laws requiring that employers participate in the arbitration to resolve differences with workers. They also advocated nationalizing railroads, telephone networks, and a graduated federal income tax. Even more radically, the Knights defended cooperatively run workshops, a forerunner of today's employee-owned companies, and cooperative stores. The Knights also opened their organization to black workers. Black people ultimately formed most of the Knights' membership in the South. But only some positions that the organization took were progressive. The Knights saw Asian immigrants as contending employers would use to keep their wages. 
They supported the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Alien Contract Labor Law of 1885, which barred companies from bringing unskilled laborers into the United States to work under contract. Even after lawmakers passed the laws, the Knights members weren't happy. In the Pacific Northwest, they attacked Chinese laborers and burned down the barracks where Chinese coal miners lived. First College Football Game The first football game was played between Princeton and Rutgers on November 6, 1869. For spectators, the game resembled soccer more closely than gridiron football. The rules governing play were based on the London Football Association's 1863 rules that disallowed carrying or throwing the ball. Moreover, the match was played with a soccer ball. As a result, it is considered the first collegiate soccer match and the birth of soccer in the United States. Because gridiron football developed from the rules of association football and rugby football, many also consider the game played on November 6 to be the first collegiate football game. Rutgers won the game 6-4. Part of the first season of college football, the game took place on November 6, 1869, at a field on College Avenue in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Because the game was played at Rutgers, it was also under, Rutgers rules. They were based on the Football Association's rules, in which two teams of 25 players attempted to score by kicking the ball into the opposing team's goal. The teams played 10 games against each other. When a team scored a dream, it counted as the end of that game, and the team with the most goals after 10 games was the winner. This format did not resemble the game of college football as known today. The first such game in the United States in which the ball is advanced by physically picking it up and running, where play is stopped by knocking down the ball carrier, and each team fields 11 members was played on June 4, 1875, between Tufts and Harvard colleges. William J. Leggett, later distinguished clergyman of the Dutch Reformed Church, was the Rutgers captain, William Gumer, who later became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New Jersey, captained the New Jersey squad. The game was played in front of approximately 100 spectators. The players from Rutgers wore scarlet colored turbans and handkerchiefs to distinguish themselves from the Princeton players. The scarlet of the Rutgers Scarlet Knights came from this episode. As the first of the 10 games began, two players from each team positioned themselves near the opponent's goal. This was presumably because the participants hoped to score quickly when the ball reached their territory on the field of play. Eleven so-called fielders were assigned to defend their territorial area on each team. Twelve participants on each team, named Bulldogs, played in the other team's territory. Rutgers was the first to score a goal, as S.G. Gano and G.R. Dixon kicked the ball across the Princeton goal. Early in the contest, the flying wedge play was first used as the team with the ball formed a wall-like formation of players, allowing them to charge at the defenders. This flying wedge tactic was successful early on for Rutgers because of its size disadvantage over Princeton. However, Princeton countered the tactic when J. Michael, better known as Big Mike, broke up Rutgers' flying wedge during the fourth game. Princeton took advantage and tied the score at 2-2. Whenever the ball entered Rutgers' territory, it would get in front of it and use a heel kick to prevent Princeton from scoring. A Rutgers player named Madison M. Ball, a wounded veteran of the American Civil War used his speed and kicked the ball with the heel of his foot to again take the lead in the contest. Ball successfully used that technique to set up Dixon to score another goal, giving Rutgers a 4-2 lead. Rutgers then allowed Princeton to score a goal as one of their players, whose identity is unknown, had kicked a ball toward their own goal. A Rutgers player blocked it, but Princeton soon took advantage to cut the lead down to 4-3. The Tigers scored on their next possession when they used a flying wedge play led by Big Mike to march down the field to score to tie the game again at four. At this point, Rutgers captain John W. Leggett had a strategy for his team. He suggested that the Rutgers team keep the ball low on the ground to counter the much taller players on Princeton. This plan appeared to work as Rutgers quickly scored the final two goals of the contest to win the first intercollegiate football game, playing six games to four. Princeton had more size, which would generally be an advantage on a field with 50 players, 
but the Tigers had trouble kicking the ball as a team which is something Rutgers did very well. In a 1933 account, a Rutgers player from the game named John W. Herbert said that he thought Rutgers was the smaller team but that, that they had more speed than Princeton. In what might be regarded as the birth of college football rivalries, immediately after Rutgers won this game, Princeton's players were run out of town by the winning Rutgers students. The Princeton students reportedly jumped in their carriages and quickly made the 20-mile trip back to their campus. Fifteenth Amendment The Fifteenth Amendment, which sought to protect the voting rights of African American men after the Civil War, was adopted into the U.S. Constitution in 1870. Despite the amendment, by the late 1870s, government officials used discriminatory practices to discourage black citizens from wielding their right to vote, particularly in the South. It wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that legal barriers were outlawed at the state and local levels if they denied African Americans their right to vote under the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Despite the amendment's passage, by the late 1870s, government officials used discriminatory practices to prevent black citizens from exercising their right to vote, especially in the South. It wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that legal barriers were denied at the state and local levels if they denied African Americans their right to vote under the 15th Amendment. In 1867, following the American Civil War and the abolishment of slavery, the Republican-dominated U.S. Congress passed the first Reconstruction Act over the veto of President Andrew Johnson. The act divided the South into five military districts and outlined how new governments based on universal manhood suffrage were to be established. With the adoption of the 15th Amendment in 1870, a politically mobilized African-American community joined with white allies in the southern states to elect the Republican Party to power, which brought about radical changes across the South. By late 1870, all the former Confederate states had been readmitted to the Union, and most were controlled by the Republican Party, thanks to the support of black voters. In the same year, Hiram Rhodes Revels, a Republican from Natchez, Mississippi, became the first African American to sit in the U.S. Congress when he was elected to the U.S. Senate. Although black Republicans never got a political office in balance to their overwhelming electoral majority, Revels and a dozen other black men served in Congress during Reconstruction, more than 600 served in state legislatures, and many more held local offices. African Americans called the amendment the nation's second birth and a more significant revolution than in 1776. The first black person known to vote after the amendment's adoption was Thomas Mundy Peterson. He cast his ballot on March 31, 1870, in a Perth Amboy, New Jersey referendum, adopting a revised city charter. African Americans, many newly freed slaves, put their newfound freedom to use, voting in scores of black candidates. During Reconstruction, 16 black men served in Congress, and 2,000 black men served in elected local, state, and federal positions. In 1876, United States v. Reese, the first U.S. Supreme Court decision interpreting the 15th Amendment, the court interpreted the amendment narrowly, upholding ostensibly race-neutral limitations on voting, including poll taxes, literacy tests, and a grandfather clause that exempted citizens from other voting requirements if their grandfathers had been registered voters. The court also noted that the amendment does not confer the right of suffrage. Still, it invests citizens of the United States with the freedom of exemption from discrimination in the exercise of the elective franchise on account of their race, color, or previous condition of servitude and empowers Congress to enforce that right by appropriate legislation. White supremacists, such as the Ku Klux Klan, used paramilitary violence to prevent blacks from voting. Several blacks were killed at the Colfax Massacre of 1873 while attempting to defend their right to vote. Congress passed the Enforcement Acts in 1870 to authorize federal prosecution of the KKK and others who violated the amendment. However, as Reconstruction neared its end and federal troops withdrew, prosecutions under the Enforcement Acts dropped considerably. Force Acts In the five years following the Civil War, the U.S. Congress passed, 
and the states ratified the Constitution's 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These amendments permanently ended slavery, and granted African Americans entry to civil rights and suffrage as citizens of the United States. Although these shifts were designed to assist the previously enslaved, violent opposition arose from white ex-Confederates who opposed them. That violence led Congress to authorize President Ulysses S. Grant to use military force to protect African Americans. The three bills passed by Congress were the Enforcement Act of 1870, the Enforcement Act of 1871, and the Ku Klux Klan Act. These acts were explicitly designed to protect African Americans' right to vote, hold office, serve on juries, and receive equal protection of laws. The Enforcement Act was, in fact, three different laws that Congress passed between 1870 and 1871. In May 1870, Congress enacted the Enforcement Act prohibiting the Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist organizations from taunting and tormenting African Americans. The act banned individuals from assembling or disguising themselves with intentions to violate African Americans' constitutional rights. The act outlined the penalties for those who chose to interfere with a citizen's right to vote. In December of 1870, Indiana Republican Senator Oliver H. P. T. Morton presented a resolution that mandated the President to convey information regarding incidents of resistance against the complete execution of the United States laws. When Congress enacted and adopted Morton's resolution, President Ulysses Grant was now obligated to report to Congress incidents of anti-black violence in the southern states. In response to the first report, a committee of the Senate, chaired by Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, opened an investigation of acts of violence against the free people across the South. The multiple incidents led to the enactment of the Second Enforcement Act, passed in February 1871. The Second Enforcement Act amended the first by adding more severe punishments to the revisions. The United States government best enforced this act. Two months later, in April 1871, Congress passed the third and final measure known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. This act outlawed terrorist conspiracies by all racist vigilantes including but not limited to the Ku Klux Klan. It allowed the president to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in regions prone to terrorist activities. Overall, the acts undermined the organized violence of the Ku Klux Klan. The acts, unfortunately, did not stop all violent opposition to African American participation in voting across the South. That violence helped overthrow Reconstruction governments in all but three ex-Confederate states by the end of President Grant's second term. The U.S. Supreme Court, in two rulings, also undermined the acts. In the United States v. Reese 1876 and United States v. Cruikshank 1876, opponents of the Enforcement Acts contested their constitutionality. The court agreed with the plaintiffs and concluded that state authorities best regulate voting rights without federal intervention. You've been listening to the RPTM Podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.